My name is Benita Elliott and I have been a member of the Peninsula Garden Club for the last eight years but have been a lifelong gardener. I've always had a vegetable garden and flowers and as I've gotten older my passion seems to have grown more and it's kept me out of trouble and enjoyed learning about more and more about different plants. Anyways, we're going to start with vegetable gardens and I have two vegetable garden areas and in this particular area I've got the tomatoes, leeks, um, three types of onions, kale and a cutting garden as long and also with asparagus in the background. Now the tomatoes, there's six different types of tomatoes and all of them were started with seeds that I had collected on a regular basis. And in the middle of summer when you get the nicest, one, most lovely tomato from a plant, save that one. You make sure it's good and ripe and cut in half and take out all the pulp, put it into a strainer and just rinse it lightly with cold water so all the, all the pulp comes out of it and, and off the seeds and then put it on a, paper on a dry paper towel, let it dry and then the next day chip the seeds off the dry paper towel and put it on another dry paper towel and make sure it's got no pulp on it. And once the seeds are really good and dry, put it on another dry paper towel, label it, it's what it is because it's amazing how you can mix them up and then just store it in a Ziploc bag in a dry dark place. Next year you can put them in and it's amazing. Their germination rate, I've had incredible germination rate for tomato seeds. This last year I put in tomato seeds of the six types that I had kept from the year before. I think I got 225 seeds all sprouted hence I had a lot of tomato plants for the plant sale and uh, we, we as a club benefited from that and it didn't cost us a cent. <laughs> Anyways, so it's always about saving the best, most um, ripe, beautiful, best tomato of, off that plant in the, in the height of the summer. With the tomatoes, you, I usually start them in um, end of February, beginning of March, and I do start them in a greenhouse on a, on a heat mat, and uh, they get good and sturdy, and you have to feed them. They, you know, after they've initially sprouted, you let them get the first few leaves, give them some fertilizer that's uh, really good for the roots. So that is your uh, potassium, no, sorry, phosphorus. So it's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, NPK, NPK. And how you remember it is up, down, and all around. Up for nitrogen, down for roots and vegetables, all around for fruits and flowers. So up, down, all around. So if you want to have a really good root crop, that's for your potassium. No phosphorus, P. <laughs> and so flowers, you want higher in potassium. And if it's a green, all your lettuces and stuff, that's where you get your nitrogen. So the up, down, all around really helps remember it. Up, down, all around, and PK for your fertilizer. So when you first put your new seedlings in, you want a really weak solution of fertilizer that is your phosphorus to give them really good roots. And then as they grow, you can give them more balanced fertilizer. Um, so this area is watered because it's full sun, but it's watered with uh, soaker hoses. And the soaker hoses I put down actually before I even plant the plants. And then I plant the plants around them on either side. And it means it, right now it looks like I've got about four inches of water along the plants. But the water goes down on a four inch strip on the top and then it goes down in a triangle and it spreads out so the roots really do get soaked. I've dug them up to see how far the water goes and I'm amazed. So the soaker hoses are pretty efficient but there are soaker hoses and there are soaker hoses so you need to uh, source out ones that you're comfortable with. There's some really good ones around. They're pricey and unfortunately I'm still finding that they are only lasting me like three or four years before they start plugging up. So I'm trying a new one this year that's more of a fabric, uh, a woven fabric cover with a um, hose inside that leaks the water and it seems to be get, delivering a bit more water at once and so you don't have to water for as long. And I'll see, I mean I'm just trying them out this year and see how, how they matter. Right now I'm quite happy with how they're doing but we'll just, the, the jury's out <laughs> to get to which type of, and I don't is install my uh, soaker hoses in the same place because I rotate my crops so some rows are closer together some aren't so I roll them all up every year store them in a dry spot because I mean so you can put your uh, get irrigation tubing with the little holes in them and 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 place it all in with elbows and everything but crop rotation is so important that's why I don't that's why I've got the soft ones because I mean last year I think potatoes were over here well I don't put the potatoes in the same pot I never I never put this I always keep a, a map too of where you plant each year so you can look back because you won't remember <laughs> to say okay that was there last year I can't put that there this year and to really keep your, your ground healthy because your each plant takes different things out of the ground 
So it's really important to do crop rotation. And if you want some further information on crop rotation and companion planting, the West Coast Seeds um, link on their site has great articles on companion planting, on what you should be planting with what, and what not to plant with what. And it's a really good guide as well. And also it talks a lot about crop rotation. There's good articles on there as well. So those are all really good resources for you to use for vegetable gardening. Okay, so I've got an asparagus patch here, and it is now six years old. And you're going to wonder, why have I got all these ferns up here? So this is the asparagus um, plant once it's gone from like this, which is a nice, fresh, delicious, perfect asparagus. When you pick them, they, you aren't supposed to see any of the little seeds or anything, because when they judge them on the parlor show, they will de take marks off for it. They're supposed to be nice and tight and firm and a real nice snap and crisp and they're absolutely delicious and I'm going to give this to one of our people to eat in a second here and she'll love it. <laughs> Anyways, each lots of the roots have to grow for three years. You can take one or two spikes off in the first couple of years and then they need to be in the ground at least three years before you start picking them. This year I've so far got over 10 pounds off but as they grow at the end of the season you need to let some of these grow and you can see I've got them all going along for every plant their growth will now rejuvenate the root structure for next year. So it's absolutely pivotal. And soon I'll be putting a, a string across here because they'll get so high that they'll sort of support them up. And they make nice screens as well. So, and they're great for flower arrangements because they're lovely and fluffy and if you want something airy. So the, uh, the, I have been freezing them this year and I just uh, do a flash blanch for less, like a minute, in and out of boiling water, put them, uh, cool them off with cold water and ice dry them and stick them on a, on a cookie sheet to freeze and then put them in a Ziploc bag and you just take however many spirits you want out. You put them on a barbecue and they are to die for good. And then you've got them all winter long if you've got too many to eat all at once because my husband doesn't like them. <laughs> and so I get to eat them all and take them places so it's great. Okay so I have a second garden plot too and you'll notice this one's all fenced because everything that's in here the deer and the raccoon love and they don't seem to stay they so they can't get at it because I've got corn and of course Nothing's worse than the raccoon coming into your corn patch when you're just thinking you're going to have fresh corn and they have decimated it when you wake up in the morning. So, so far they have not gotten into this patch. I have garlic that uh, it was put in in October and it's just getting really nice. It's got good thick strong stems. So I'm hoping I'm going to have some really nice big cloves of garlic. Uh, romaine lettuce. And then under the covers I have two, I've got um, carrots and I've got all my barascas. When I talk about barascas it, it's um, broccoli. Uh, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and kale. And they're covered because for the carrot flies, it prevents the carrot fly from going onto the carrots and then you get the little worms in the carrots. And I put them on, the cover on when I plant them. When the seeds go on the, in, the plant cover goes on as well. And I've been doing this for the last many years and I keep my carrots in the ground all winter, pull them as I need them because actually this bed is a raised bed. We raised up the, 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 the lawn around it, actually a raised bed. Um, and they drain and they keep fresh and they're, uh, they are Bolero carrots and they keep really well over winter and they're lovely and sweet and, and it just really worked well. Under the brassicas, they're all covered because you get those lovely little white moths that blow around and they le lay lovely seeds under the leaves and little yellow uh, seeds and they may become lovely big hungry green worms and there's nothing worse than picking a nice head of broccoli that you think looks lovely and it's full of green worms and it's like it really puts you off and it puts you off for all your work and you think what am I going to do with this and it really prevents them. I make it an odd one but very very few and even once you've cut off your broccoli top you leave your plant in the ground it will continue to give you little broccoli florets well into like December. I was eating fresh broccoli you know you could go out and get a little bowl no problem every couple of weeks and it was great. So put I really uh, encourage you to invest in row covers for those types of plants. You can get it at one of our local nurseries. It is a woven row cover. It's called Polyvitec versus the Rime, which falls apart very quickly. It's it's all sort of pressed in and you can't rewash or anything. I wash this every year in the washing machine. A little soap, a little bleach, takes all the mildew, anything off of it, any of the germs, start again the next spring. So yes, you put a fair bit out because um, I think it's about a dollar fifty a foot and, it, and these are two thirty foot lengths but this is the fifth year I've used them so it, it really is worthwhile to, to get it. 
Does that keep the heat out or the heat in? It does act as a bit of a heat shield, but the rain does go through. Okay. And so um, and they, everything's still green, so it gets enough sun, but it does act as a bit of, especially when they're young, to get heat, to get burnt leaves, because they will do that. Um, again, soaker hoses to, uh, are put down before I, I plant, and either side, the uh, brassicas were all started in the greenhouse in advance, and so they're put out as seedlings, as starters. And then I've got things like uh, the beets and the uh, peas, beans, spinach, were all planted in the ground. Um, I have for year, many years, I would do my um, cucumbers and squashes and stuff and seed them in advance in the greenhouse. They don't like to be transplanted out and they sort of stall for the first two to three weeks when you transplant them out. If you put them in, you know, second, third week of May, the soil is warm enough, they will sprout and they just take off and they don't, and it, it as far as when your fruits are ready, it's the same. So why fiddle around transplanting when it will grow the same in the garden? So it works out really well. So and there's um, also at the end there, you know, I've got herbs. I've got arugula and dill and uh, many a few types of different type of basil. So um, you find too that you plant what you know you're going to eat. Don't plant things. Oh, it looks lovely. I love it. And you're not going to eat it. It's a lot of work. So and you've already got so much space and area. So plant what you like to eat and, and go for, and you can get second crops. My spinach is really getting beautiful right now. I will probably be picking it and putting a second crop in um, because, and I will freeze the spinach into cubes because uh, I always find in the middle of winter I need spinach for stews or sauces and things and they go well why didn't I freeze it in the summer? So you know things like that and so little um, cupcake holders, little ice cube trays are great for things like that. So um, this, this particular area keeps the, the, the lovely critters out. Yes. Did you save any seeds of any of these things? Um, I have not saved any of these seeds. No, um, they're a little bit trickier. I mean, you have to, you could. I mean, you could leave a couple of spinach plants in. You could leave a couple of lettuce plants in, but and and let them go up and, and flower and 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 go to seed. Um, it just it's possible, absolutely. And the beets, they're all possible. Mind you, I don't think my beets have ever bolted to and, and, and flowered ever. So I'm not sure whether you'd have to live in you know, all year or not. Yeah. But certainly yeah. the lettuce and the spinach would do it for you. The yeah. corn, I, I suspect you could probably save it too. Okay. That's it for this area. Yeah, perfect. So for, for deer proving, this is really lightweight netting. It's light, but they love this midwinter fire dogwood. So I just lay it on top of them. You can't really tell that it's there, and then the deer don't eat it. And um, it's 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 very um, not intrusive in your garden, innocuous. but innocuous. Uh, innocuous, yes, yeah. and and it, it really protects your plants. So you can get the netting at places like Buckerfields or Integrity. There's a really interesting plant up here that I got a couple of years ago that I sort of fell in love with, and the deer don't like it. It's called sweet bush, and if you rub its leaves. And you smell it, it's quite sweet. And its, it's other name is called uh, Calicarpus Aphrodite. And it's got the most amazing flower. And it's just, this year it's got fabulous uh, blooms. The, the deer routinely rock down this path and it hasn't touched it. And it's just, it's spectacular. And it likes a nice sunny spot. So it's doing really nicely here. I'm just totally impressed. It's come out in the last couple of days, which has been really nice. Which is a really nice one. Over on this other side, this is a very, very hot bed. The sun is in here all day long and really hot. So this spring, I did have heathers in here. They did not like it, even though they had water. So I tore it all out. And I took the rock that I dig out of the ground to plant trees. I get, collect rocks. So I made a, a stylized wave here and put everything that is drought tolerant in here. And so far, it's everything is doing well. So you really need to plant for the environment. If you've got drought tolerant, if you've got heat, put things that uh, don't, that like the heat. So I've got agapanthus, I've got, uh, these are Beacon Hill Pines. Um, I've got some um, scabiosa that I, I grew out of some seed this year in the greenhouse. And there'll be perennials. They come up every year. And, um, oh, I'm having a blonde moment of what that grass is. Um, mid mid summer no um, and then of course the formium and then the piteous form at the end so they're all very uh, drought tolerant love the heat and um, i've tried to you know the grasses give it some movement uh, but in the winter 
um, the agapanthus or, and the flowers will die down, but you still got the structure of the evergreens and, and the formium and the, and the grasses will still be up. So that'll give them some, some interest. So uh, th this is, bed is really just settling in right now and uh, improving, hopefully. <laughs> Okay, growing roses. So you can see that I've got quite a rose bed here, but it's all about location for roses. They need sun and they need lots of ventilation and air to circulate uh, uh, around the roses so that they don't get disease. The minute you get them without enough circulation, enough air, they'll start getting the black spot, they'll get mold, mildew, all sorts of diseases. So location 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 for roses when you're planning to put them in make sure they are airy got the sun they like to, they like to have a bit of water like you know, deep water once a week but they don't like to have wet feet and so i mean luckily this was a raised bed so they don't have wet feet and they each have little water heads but it makes a huge difference they also like to be fed and so in about i think it was beginning of march I fed them with uh, magnesium sulfate, which is Epsom salts. Just, you, you don't have to dissolve it in water. You can just sprinkle it around the roots because it's gonna rain on them and it's gonna go in. And it's a couple of tablespoons per plant and then a couple of tablespoons of alfalfa pellets. And it really helps the root growth and the number of blooms. And you can see this year, these things are loaded with blooms. They have blooms after blooms and they are quite healthy. But the other trick for roses, you need to come out every morning and say hello to them and check out if they've got any aphids, if there's any little green worms on them, because the little green worms, and it was, it was about a month ago, you, you have a little chunk out of a leaf and you think, well, and you look on and you didn't find anything, but if you looked really close, he was right along the cut edge. And you have to just take your finger and squish it. And you know what, in, in about two weeks, you'd have no little green worms left and you just, Check out each one and see, and see their progress. And it's really about keeping a close eye on them. If you see a bud that has an aphid on it, you just go along and squish them and squish them off. And, and then you, you keep control of them before you have a huge infestation. So really it's about observing your flowers and your new buds. They love the new growth is where they absolutely love. Like something like this here, they, it's so tender to them. That's where they're going to be. You really look for the new growth uh, on the roses and, and under the leaves. You, you're forever going, okay, where are you? And if you're taking a, a disease leaf off for roses, you take the leaf and I'm just going to find, oh, here's one. I just, oh, it doesn't have to be a little disease one. Uh, you take a leaf and it's got a hole in it. Just take it at the stem and tear it down. It, and it comes off really easy then. If you try to pull at it, you might break your stem and, and break your flower, but it just, you just, you, you pull it down. If you get a, a, a black, a, a rose bramble in you, put your head down and it'll come out. Cause it's always when you've gone up into it, it's always bringing down. Cause all the brambles, they, the thorns, they, they face downward. So that is a key thing. If you cut up, put your head, pull your arm back out and it'll come off easily. So there's all sorts, of, if you're buying roses, look at the description of the rose. Um, there are many of the new cultivars have all been bred to be disease resistant, black uh, spot resistant that are really, and they will say on the description, they'll say, you know, resistant to diseases, resistant to this. Um, and it really does make a difference because you will find if, if, if that doesn't say that on the label, I don't buy them anymore because it's just not worth the, the time and effort. The yellow rose over in the corner is Julia Child. And she's got to be, in my mind, one of the most disease resistant roses I've ever seen. Her foliage is leathery, green, shiny. She looks like that all year. Uh, it, she's just an amazing disease resistant flower. But every once in a while, you may find a rose that you think, oh, I gotta have that one. And you might put up with a little bit more fussing with it because it's just an amazing flower. But uh, the David Austin roses, a lot of them are really Bred beautifully, but all the uh, the um, growers of roses really are really looking to be disease. They will bloom all summer, so for bang for the buck, you get flowers. You deadhead them regularly, and when you deadhead them, if you've got a bloom like this big bloom here, you would when it's done, you would prune it off to the first leaf that has five little leaves. Prune it to there; it will re-sprout and give you a new bloom. 
So just don't deadhead it there. You need to actually cut it off to the first five leaf um, stamp and you will get rose production all summer long. There's not too many other plants in your garden that are going to give you flowers all summer long. So yeah, they're a little fussy up front, but they really are great performers. And there's nothing lovelier. First thing the morning you come out and you take a whiff of this absolutely amazing fragrance. And uh, they are just quite amazing flowers. They really are. And, but you can't put them where the deer are going to be because they will, they will destroy them. They love these little candies. These little, no, they just absolutely love them and they will just nip them all off and you'll be totally annoyed. So they have to be in an area where there's no deer or you're going to be very disappointed. So there you go. It, it, it sort of wiggles. It's got this, this sort of, it's really, it's a, it's a, it's a fabulous, it's a perennial. And it's called Estrancha, and there's different uh, types. This one here has got more burgundy tone, and then this one's got the white with the pale pink edges. And I've got another one that's over in this corner, but it's just its second year, and it's not nearly as big. But they are fabulous as cut flowers. They last forever, and they just add that sort of little under interest because they're so um, structural. The lovely little star shapes, and the bees are absolutely loving this. They're just totally amazed. <laughs> and they aren't bothering you, and I'm just looking to see if they got any pollen on their back legs. Oh my goodness. And they're just in there and just, like there are three of these guys, are not care less that I'm here. So I'm absolutely delighted that this has grown so much this year and uh, has really developed. And it's a, it's a nice little perennial that takes a couple of years to establish, but once it does, it's a great little plant. Um, you know, it's got some early morning sun shade in the middle of the day, but then it gets more sun and it does need some sun, of course, but it's a, it's a great plant. This is a double bicolor cosmos and they are a beautiful new type of cosmos that um, are easy to grow. Um, they have got, they're just such interesting flowers. They last, they will bloom all summer. Just, you know, as they start to fade, deadhead them. Like this one is, is softer, but this one's got the pink on the outside of the, of the flower. And then this little white one here has just white with a little bit of pink. And they are great as a cut flower. They are so tolerant. As I say, they're a really easy plant to grow. And uh, um, I will definitely grow these again versus just the plain cosmos because they, this has just got such pop power in your garden. It's just a beautiful little plant. Okay, so this is an example of a shade sun garden. On my right hand side here, it is shady all day long, but on this left hand side, as the sun comes around, this gets really hot and dry. So what do you plant? <laughs> and so you can see on the right hand side, it's all ferns, pastas, things that like shade uh, in, in that area, and they do very nicely. Of course, they're in competition with all the roots from these lovely big canopy that we have so you have to have things too that are going to survive that that have um, the root structure like your hostas have really sturdy strong roots and the hellebores that are in there they can they can compete with the fine hair roots from the trees and still do well um, some finer things they don't they just don't survive it but on this this side here on the left it's got things for sun so i have planted quite a few different flowers there's um, some Queen Anne's lace that's coming up here, some larkspur, and then some stalks, and then again the, the double bicolor uh, cosmos as well. And they like the sun, and it's going to be quite a nice display of flowers. They're all just about ready to come out, and um, it'll be it'll be quite pretty and a real combination in the transition. But you really have to think again about the location of your garden and what the conditions are like and what you plant there. Because if you try to put these flowers over in this shade, they get long and leggy and they wouldn't look nice at all. So you re it, 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 the one thing that you learn as you garden is you, the more you garden, don't fight where you are, but what likes the area. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to, it's not going to thrive. In two or three years, it's going to say, I've had it. 
So we really put things that really light the area and uh, go from there. The other thing as you, as we are all getting older and as we garden, you start thinking more and more about how much work do I really want to do. And I am getting more and more into small dwarf shrubs and small plants that don't need a lot of work. I, I, I can certainly tolerate them needing to be pruned once a year or cut back once a year. But um, as we all get older, you really have to start thinking that way. You don't want to be staking and, you know, having to deadhead everything every other day and things like that. So you really need to think about that as far as how much work you really want to do. And so there's some fabulous small dwarf conifer shrubs out, some lovely evergreen ones that are, all the pidiosporums are great um, for different types of plants that are really low um, work, but high impact and look really great. And look at those color combinations. You, if you've got a big bold leaf, you want something that's light and airy to go with it, that the wind can blow through. The grasses, the grasses are underused, I think. There's so many beautiful ones. They're drought tolerant. There's gorgeous colors. Um, really look, grasses, there's long, tall ones, there's short ones, there's, you know, for every little space. So really look at those color combinations and the difference of, uh, of the contrast between big and bold and soft and light and airy and the colors. So if you've got a purple vein, get a, 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 a New Zealand flax for me in the purple to, to pull out that, to have those contrasts again. So really look and stand back and look at your gardens for, for those contrasts uh, as you design it and change it. Because that's what we do. We dig up and we move things and we change things because, oh, I didn't like that or that's done well, but that hasn't. So that's really important lessons learned as, as you go along. And they like to be split and then you get a new plant for free. So there you go. So, or plant it up for the plant sale. So. So I hope I've given you a few little tips to learn from and uh, help you in your own gardening journeys and uh, hope you found this interesting and that uh, you keep yourself busy and occupied with these lovely days that are a challenge. They find the pleasure of just stopping and smelling the roses or whatever plant smells wonderful and, and enjoying what your works of the day and take that garden to a really day that lasts a lot. Thanks.